Hey guys, good morning. It's uh, August, um, Friday the 18th. I actually graduate tomorrow, so that's that's pretty cool. Can't wait to do that. I have family flying in tonight. I'll probably catch dinner uh, tomorrow or something. I, I really don't know what the plans are, but anyway, I figured I'd get the third part out. It looks like we are going into the story of Abraham and beginning of that. So it will cover between Genesis 12 through 17. I just kind of talk about what happens in that and so I can kind of read. Uh, Genesis 11 was pretty much the, I'm sorry, 10 and 11 were pretty much the uh, genealogy after Noah's uh, flood and his kids' descendants up until Abraham. Uh, but, believe it or not, for five chapters, he actually is just called Abram. That, that's his name. If you weren't aware, uh, before Abraham got his name, his name was Abram, and his wife Sarah was originally Sarai. So, uh, they... We'll, we'll talk about it as we get further into it, but... Um, in Genesis 12, it says, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who will bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth and will be blessed through you. So, a kind of general theme through these five chapters is that God is reassuring, is reminding, is talking with uh, Abram that um, he will be the father of multiple nations and uh, just kind of demonstrate that point, that prediction, because um, we, we do believe that the Bible is self-sufficient and uh, it proves itself more, uh, time and time again. Um, I'm an American. I'm a Christian, as much as that label is abused nowadays. Um, this is from a Jewish book from Judea from 2,000 years ago, where the only people had access to this were from scrolls, from the Torah, and uh, it's uh, just, just amazing to see how far it's come and far it will go. I, I, I believe that this will eventually be in space. I know that sounds silly, but my prediction from 100 years from now, if Jesus hasn't come back yet, is that this book will be in space, changing people's lives. Anyway, uh, so Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And Lot was uh, Abram's nephew, so... Abram had a brother named Haran, and Haran had a son named Lot, and so that's how they're related. Uh, so it, uh, the Lord pretty much asked Abram to move, to leave. He was being called to another area, and that area was, uh, uh, let me see, I want to make sure I get it right for you guys. He took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And we'll talk about more about the slave stuff as we get further into this. There's there's a general rule of thumb why I, it doesn't bother me. But I'll explain that later. Uh, from there he went on towards the hill east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west. And I is spelled A-I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and call, called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while, because the famine was severe. And he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me but let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I'll be, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. 
When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. And when the Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to the Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram required sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on the Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram, What have you done to me? he said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then the Pharaoh gave orders about, the, about Abram to his men and then sent him on to his way with his wife and everything he had. And it's, it's pretty interesting that uh, uh, we have Abram telling his wife. Uh, I, to me, I, I don't understand why that was the case. There might have been a similar societal uh, difference that we may not understand in ours. That, from their perspective, that uh, that wife would have been stolen. But there's a part of me that Abram was just kind of a little conflicted, maybe too worried not to trust God, and that sense when they were dealing with the pharaohs but <clears throat> excuse me so abram went out from egypt to the negev with his wife and everything he had and lot went with him and now lot was moving about uh, with abram also had flocks and herds of and tents but the land could not support them while they stayed together for the possessions were so great when they were not able to stay and they were not able to stay together so they fought, they quarreled, they argued, whatever you want to say. Lot and Abram, of course, they were still family. They just understood the situation that they just couldn't stay together because of the amount of things and the amount of resources that took to feed those things. And uh, I'm talking about their own family, the servants, the cattle, the sheep, everything that needs food to live. Just it took a mass amount of resources. Anyway, so Lot went to go live with, or live nearby Sodom, and Abraham went to go live by um, the opposite way, which is closer uh, to the Mamre at Hebron. If I mispronounce that, I apologize. I know that there are more knowledgeable vernacular scholars out there than me. <laughs> but, uh,. Look up for me, I didn't know. Okay. So this begins to kind of talk about the conflict that they are living near, which is the Dead Sea Valley. Uh, I don't really know. I know that's over by the Dead Sea, but I don't know if that is something that is still around or not. But in the geographical sense, that's that's kind of where it's by. But it, during their time, it was called the Valley of the Sidim. And uh, there was uh, nine total kings interested in this area. So uh, there was eventually a war. Uh, I believe it's kind of expanded on in the First and Second Chronicles. So we might dive deeper into those books when we get to that point. But... Eventually what happened was that Lot was uh, taken by the opposing kings, not Sodom and Gomorrah's kings, respectively. They actually fled when uh, they were losing the war, and that's when Lot was taken. And so, uh, Abram saw this happen, and so he commanded 318 men to split up and go save the men, or save them. And the other half went to go take the possessions back. And so, uh, for this, uh, I believe the, uh, the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or a strap or a sandal, so that you'll never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I'll accept nothing but what my men have eaten, 
and then then the share that belongs to the men who have went with me to honor Esh- Eshkel and Mamre. Let them have their share. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. And so this kind of uh, goes into where uh, God is reassuring Abram that he'll be a father of many nations. And both Abram, you know, he it kind of demonstrates, point back to creation, but... And let's see with this explanation, but Abram immediately follows what God says, falls to his knees and praises God. And that's great and everything. And, uh, but they're not sure. They're not sure because they're like, well, we're, we're both old. So are are you sure about that? And, uh, again, God reassures them that yes, you'll, you'll be a father of many nations, but eventually uh ooh sorry getting ahead of myself then the lord um uh, if we're as we're going on through the text uh subsequent events before I was going into what I was saying uh then the lord said to him no for cer- for certain that f- for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own and they will be s- enslaved and mistreated there but I'll punish the nations they serve as slaves, and afterward uh, will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites has not reached its full measure. When the sun had set and the darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenitzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphaites, Amorites, Canaanites, the Girgashites, and Jebusites. Now Sarai, and this is kind of getting into where Sarai uh, wasn't so sure, so she actually doubted God and that promise. So she commanded her her servant or her slave or whatever you want to call it uh, to, well, in my book, I'll be honest with you guys, it says Egyptian slave uh, named Hagar uh, to be with Abram. And he agreed because it was the owner of that slave, what she wanted him to do with that slave. And, uh, she was mistreated for this from Sarai and, uh, Sarai mistreated Abram because of it. So, um, which is not okay. I mean, you don't gaslight your husband for you wanting something. Women can be confusing, but (laughs) I digress. Um, anyway, so the angel of the Lord said to Hagar, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard of your misery. He'll be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he'll live in hostility toward all his brothers. And she gave uh, gave this name to the Lord who spoke her. You are the lo- you are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Beer Lahai Boy or Roy. I apologize. It is still there between Kadesh and Barad. So Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son he had born. Abram was eighty six year old. 86 years old when Hagar born him Ishmael and to me this uh like I don't know I don't know if this is just my first instinct but uh this this idea of Ishmael coming and being born out of a mistress and everything uh well they were technically married because 
I, I guess, common law married or whatever, but regarding that, uh, to me it seems like the beginning of Islam, uh, where these three nation nations uh, were born out of this relationship between the three, three of them, Sarai, Abram, and Hagar, and uh, they pretty much, uh, I mean, this is why you hear the term Abrahamic religions whenever uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are being talked about. Um, to me, there should be a great brotherhood between all three of them, that we all serve a mighty God, but I feel like man's wickedness always gets in the way of that, and instead of celebrating the common denominators in those religions, we decide to fight over the differences, but there is serious doctrinal differences that are justifiably justifiably able to be fought over in my opinion like uh all three of them agreed jesus was a great teacher he was a a prophet because our bible does say he was a prophet and uh but the other two disagree when jesus declared right and he didn't outrightly say that he was god but he said in other ways that declared him to be as in, I am before Abraham was, in Matthew, and uh, so many other instances of that. So to me, it just kind of to me there there's there's issues with the other two that are you know Judaism being ignorant of the fact of the eyewitness accounts in the New Testament, and then Islam ultimately twisting it and then making it serve a, a, uh, a false prophet warlord. So it's, 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 it's sad to see whenever we take those differences and fight over it and, um, insult each other online. I, I believe that there should be a friendly debate and I know my name calling isn't good, but to me, it's just, it's basically just pointing out my thoughts on it without diving deeper into it. So, anyway, the the uh, uh, the eventual thing uh, when Abr Abram was ninety nine years old is when he actually uh, received his covenant with the Lord, and uh, to represent that change, he was renamed to be Abraham, and. Uh, uh, Sarah, or Sarai, got her name changed when she was 90, and they both bore a son, Isaac, and, uh, we'll kind of go into that later, and, uh, but kind of quickly, because I think my phone's limiting on time, I just have to clean out space, but, uh, with the slave thing, and I'll probably talk more into it as we read the Bible more, but... The Bible doesn't condone anything, or it doesn't, I misuse that word, it doesn't, um, God doesn't directly say these things are wrong because it was a man's institute. We created the uh, slavery device. It doesn't promote slavery. It talks about it. It doesn't negate it. It doesn't. Uh, promote it it gives us rules on how we're supposed to treat these people and we're su essentially supposed to treat them treat them like family even within the five chapters that i've read it's talking at, uh, about the slaves as relatives in that family in lot's family and Abra abraham's family and we have to understand that we as a society the modern day society now is completely different to how it was back then. So of course we're going to think that we know better. And I'm sorry if we try to negate the societal values and societal differences of the past instead of learning from it and trying to improve from it. 
were fools. Simple as that. I believe that slavery is wrong. I believe uh, owning another person's wrong. But, like I said, slavery was a man made institute to promote labor through someone else's suffering. That's why the warlord, warlords in Africa, their own people sold Africans to us in the 1800s and the 1700s. That's why the same thing happened with the Jew, Jewish people during that prediction that we just read about from the Egyptians. That's why the Irish people were slaves. This is why I'm sure at some point everybody else was a slave. So it's, it's a foolish thing to try to blame the Bible when it actually tries to promote the idea of relativity to these people that we're all made in God's image. So instead of blaming something successful, we need to promote the idea that other societies operated differently. We can't blame the past, but we definitely can learn from it. But the idea is I get very angry whenever I see people try to blame the Bible for, for promoting slavery. And that's just not the case. It's, it's like, oh, we'll make up false things. and But I don't know if there's a string of truth to anyone, to any one person that is calling this out. I've tried doing research within the last four years of my walk, but I've continuously not found anything other than the idea of both God telling us to relate to these people as relatives in our own family, or Jesus saying that anyone who strikes them down or murders them illegally, it's just wrong. Even in the Ten Commandments, that... Legal killing is when you're defending yourself or someone's walking into your house in the middle of the night to rob you or kill you. That's all it says about it. About harming other people, anyway. But, tell me what you guys think. I'm happy to always have this conversation to try to further my understanding. And as we go through the rest of the Bible, because look at that. This is, this is... Genesis 17 on this page. This is the rest of the Bible. So maybe I'll change my view. Maybe not. But the last four years going through it, I so far haven't. I'm willing to challenge the idea that uh, it's always a societal difference. And we can always learn from the past to get better. Anyway, hope you all have a good day. Bye.